Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Let's pray and just ask for the Lord's help today as we open up His Word. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank You for Your Word. Lord, that when we are wondering what You might be saying, what You might be calling us to, how You want to guide us and direct us, Lord, we have Your Word to lead us, your very voice, which you tell us is living and active. And so, Lord, we trust your voice. We we trust your voice today to do what you do, to accomplish what you want to accomplish. We trust that what is read today and what is proclaimed today from your word will not be in vain, but that you will accomplish with it what you set out to accomplish. And so, Lord, we trust you. We ask for your help today. We pray in your name. Amen. Well, my wife and I are watching a fascinating TV series. Um, I'm sure maybe some of you have seen this or are familiar with it, but it's from um, several years ago. But it's, this, it's these two best friends that are deciding to motorbike across the world from uh, London to New York City on motorbikes. And it is fascinating watching someone try to accomplish this. I don't want to spoil any of it for you if you haven't seen it, if you find it. Be aware there is some explicit language, just so you know. But it is fascinating to watch these two best friends adventure across the world on bikes. It's incredible. But there's, there, there's this, what's been so amazing for us as we're watching this is we're watching these two guys do something that at points is so daunting and dangerous to where like they could literally die doing some of these things and yet they're just filled with joy. They're just like cheery. And it's not ignorance because you, you, I mean, you can, they know what they're doing, but there's these moments where my, my wife and I are just watching. We're like, how are they laughing right now? <laughs> like at one point they're, they're in these motorbikes crossing rivers, like flowing rivers of like several feet high. And they're just riding on through and almost tipping over and support cars are following them, almost tipping. Like it's just very dangerous. <laughs> and they're just cracking jokes and they're having a blast and they're having so much fun. And it's just amazing to watch. And I wonder if, if you've ever had an experience like that where maybe you're doing something that you know in the moment like, this is really dangerous, but you have this like joy about you. Like there's something you're finding in the midst of the hardship that just makes it not only bearable, but actually joyful to do. If anybody's a thrill seeker, you're, you're that like kind of person. You, you, you know that, right? Like if you've ever been skydiving or something, like you're doing something incredibly dangerous and yet you're smiling the whole time. Right? There, there's just something uh, there, uh, about moments like that that are so fascinating to me. Where, where, where people can find something in the midst of hardship that outweighs the pain or the risk. And as we're coming towards the end of this letter in the book of 1 Peter, Peter, the author, is again and again encouraging Christians in their suffering for the name of Jesus. And he says some outrageous things, especially today, about what is to be found in suffering for Christ. That there are some things to be found in the midst of the suffering, in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the risk, that actually bring joy to the process. Some things that if we can discover them, might just transform how we experience suffering and persecution for the name of Jesus. So, verse 12, he has this incredible statement about something we can find in suffering, and it's joy. Listen to what he says. Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you, 
to test you as though something strange were happening. Instead, rejoice. So he's writing to Christians suffering for being followers of Jesus, telling them, hey, when you suffer for the name of Christ, don't be surprised. Now, it's important to point out that the kind of suffering that they're experiencing at this point, Christians in the first century, is probably not losing your life. That was coming pretty quickly. But at this point in the Roman Empire, most likely that it wasn't the state-sponsored execution just yet. That was coming shortly after. But at this point, it was probably mostly just verbal or social persecution. And I think that's important to understand because it's very similar to our culture in 2021. Most people in the United States are not losing their life to state-sponsored execution for being a Christian. But we are experiencing verbal persecution, social pressures and persecution that are very similar to this audience. And we have to hear the words of Peter because he's encouraging people that, that are experiencing this kind of persecution and the way that they viewed this kind of persecution now was preparing them for how to engage with suffering when it would become life-threatening. Maybe at some point that happens for us. I don't know. But the way that we engage with this kind of suffering now will prepare us in the same way it prepared them for anything worse that might come in the future. You can't just expect, well, when suffering gets worse, then I'll prepare for it. That's not really how preparation works. So I think Peter's words are really important for us as well. And he says, don't be surprised when you suffer for Christ. If you look at the life of Jesus and how he discipled his disciples, he discipled his disciples to expect suffering. To expect it. To literally, as you live, expect that to be the response to you. Our culture and many churches across our country that are, have bad theology and are not preaching good things are actually discipling you to expect prosperity for being a follower of Jesus. Those are so opposed to one another. If Jesus disciples his disciples to expect suffering for being a Christian, but we're hearing other people telling us to expect prosperity for being a Christian, we have to choose who, whose voice we're going to listen to. And I don't know about you, I'd prefer to listen to the voice of Jesus. Amen. Who, who tells us to expect suffering. Our minds, we talked about this a little bit through 1 Peter, but our minds have been trained to think suffering means something went wrong. Right? Suffering means something went wrong. Just look at our world right now. All, all the things that are being shared are, let's get back to normal. Right? Suffering is abnormal. If, th if there is suffering, it must mean something went wrong. And let's return to normal as soon as possible. When you read the pages of Scripture, you read through the New Testament, the story of the church, suffering is very normal. It is to be expected. Remember that Jesus Himself was perfect. And yet, He was persecuted. He suffered greatly. Think about that, right? He loved people perfectly. He showed mercy to people perfectly. He forgived perfectly. He had a perfect view of justice. He never once wronged someone, ever. And yet, he was murdered. And somehow, we as 2021 Christians think that we can follow that Jesus and just go through life kind of unscathed expecting that we should be fine. Nothing should happen to us. And if anything does go wrong, well, then it's our right to demand that that change because suffering should not come to us just for being followers of Jesus. Let's just look at the life of Christ. Expect that. We've talked about this before. If we aren't experiencing some kind of suffering or persecution for being a follower of Jesus, we have to ask the question, why? We have to. To hear the words of Jesus that say, they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If we're not seeing 
any kind of that, we have to ask ourselves why. And I think it's, it's, it, the answer is probably one of two things. Either we are being such a great faithful witness of Christ and people are responding with repentance and faith all the time to our message that we're proclaiming. So therefore, there's not so much persecution because we're seeing revival. We're just seeing people come to know Christ and put their faith and their trust in Him. And they're responding in faith instead of with persecution. Or... Maybe people don't even know you're a Christian. Maybe we're not actually representing him to our communities, to our neighbors, to our world, to our workplace. Maybe I'm hiding Christ and the gospel from my community. Because if I am to expect suffering and persecution, but I'm not seeing it, it's either because people are responding in faith, which is beautiful and amazing, and let's rejoice, or maybe I'm actually hiding Christ. Because he's told me to expect suffering when I represent him. We've got to hear that. We have to own that. So he says, instead of being surprised as if something strange is happening to you, what is this suffering for being a Christian? <laughs> instead of being surprised, <laughs> rejoice. What in the world? Rejoice when you are persecuted and suffer for the name of Christ. How in the world can you say those words, Peter? If you're scorned, if you're mocked, if you're fired, if you're ostracized, if you're rejected, if you're beaten, if you're hated, rejoice. Rejoice in that because you're sharing in the suffering of Christ. In fact, when you read through the New Testament, you actually see this theme time and time again. I pulled a few verses for us in the New Testament. Let's look at some of them. In James, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Or Romans, we rejoice in our sufferings. 2 Corinthians, I will boast of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Or the book of Acts, after some of Jesus' disciples have just been beaten for being a follower of Jesus and preaching His name, they left rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name of Jesus. Or Colossians, I rejoice in my sufferings. Romans 8, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed. You cannot read the New Testament and come away concluding that suffering should be foreign. In fact, it should be something we rejoice in if we want to be aligned with the early church and the Word of God. They see joy in it. And let me be clear about this. You will never find joy in suffering for Jesus. You will never find it unless He has captured your heart. This is, this is why becoming a follower of Jesus is not just a decision you make. Becoming a follower of Jesus is the Holy Spirit awaking your heart to faith. Because if that doesn't happen and you're just relying on your own grit and your will to say, I made a decision to follow and do this, when suffering comes, you won't rejoice. Because Christ hasn't captured your heart. But when God awakens your heart to faith and you experience suffering, you can actually rejoice in it. And so he actually commands us to rejoice. And he tells us why in 1 Peter. In verse 13 he says, Rejoice so that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. So he says, Rejoice now when you suffer for Jesus. And the reason why you should do that is so that when Jesus returns, you will be overjoyed when He comes. That's what that, that phrase means, to rejoice and be glad. It's this idea of being overjoyed. So Peter's saying, rejoice now in suffering for Christ, so that when He returns, you will be overjoyed. So he's making this connection between joy in suffering now and joy at the return of Christ. But what's the connection between those two? How are those two connected? 
the joy that you and I can know now in suffering is like a foretaste of the joy that we will know at His second coming. And what's the joy that we get at the second coming of Christ? It is that our King has come. It is that He has returned to make all things new. To inaugurate fully His kingdom. To bring the things that He has already accomplished into full reality. In other words, what we rejoice at when Jesus returns is that He is here. We rejoice in Him. Above all things, it is joy in Him, His person. So the connection Peter is making is that if you are going to find joy, if that's the joy that's coming at His return, well then the joy in suffering, if it's a foretaste of that, then it will be the same thing. So what is the joy that we are to find in suffering now? Well, if it's to be connected to His second coming, it means that in suffering for Christ, we get forced to rely on just Him and enjoy just Him. That's why I think Peter says, rejoice in suffering because when you suffer for Christ, you get stripped of all the other things and you get to enjoy only Him, which is a foretaste of His coming. When all the temporary fades away, and what do you get? You get Christ. When there's no suffering or persecution, our hands tend to fill up with all kinds of comforts. You know this. But in suffering, our merciful Savior does for us what we will so scarcely ever do on our own. And that is empty our hands. To say all the things I've been clinging to and holding to, I don't, I don't need them. Empty our hands. In suffering, our merciful Savior does that for us. Right? All, the, all the illusions of, of self-sufficiency that we desperately cling to, he strips from us and we find our hands empty in suffering. Or all the comfort of pleasure and safety and security that we eagerly grasp to. He strips from us and what do we find? We find our hands empty. Or all the, the plans that we cling to or the lust for control that we clutch to, He strips it from us and we find our hands are empty. As a gracious father, when we suffer, what God is doing is He takes the toys and the trinkets and the idols and the fleeting things that we've been so distracted by. And He graciously takes them out of our hands so that now they're empty. But He doesn't just leave us there. He doesn't just empty your hands for the sake of having empty hands. He then lifts up our weak and weary heads and He gives us this invitation to say, Come to me. Let me fill those empty hands. Not with trinkets, not with temporary things, but let me fill those empty hands with myself. And as we come to Him with those empty hands, all of a sudden what we find is now our hands can hold way more than we ever thought they ever could. They hold things way more substantial than we ever thought. We find better comfort, better security, better pleasures. And it's here, once we've had our hands emptied and then filled with just Jesus, we see the vanity of the things that we used to cling to. We see the foolishness of our self-sufficiency, the emptiness of being our own provider, our own king. And it's here where we're finally ready to hear those words of the old hymn that say, Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Suffering for Christ makes us realize 
that all we need is in Christ. In fact, it tends to be only suffering for Christ that wakes us up to realize that, that all we need is in Christ. And so when that happens, Peter says, rejoice. Rejoice because God is graciously taking things out of your hands that you don't need and He's filling it with Himself. And enjoy that. Delight in that. Rejoice in that because that is what it will be like when He comes at His return. He will fill you immeasurably with Himself. So if we rejoice in that now, we'll be overjoyed when He returns. And so if you've never put your faith in Christ, there is an invitation not just to make a decision. There's an invitation to repent and believe in Jesus and what He's done on the cross so that you can enjoy Him. Becoming a follower of Jesus is, yes, about surrender, but it's also about saying, I will find joy in nothing else but the eternal, most joyful thing, which is Jesus. So church, if you and I are running from suffering, if we are running away from situations or having to say things that, might, that might cause suffering for the name of Christ, we are worshiping idols. We are saying, I'd rather hold on to the trinkets that bring me comfort than to have my hands emptied and only hold on to Christ. But there's good news. You can repent and turn from that. Because he's already paid for those sins. So rejoice. Don't be surprised. Rejoice. He continues on. Verse 14. It says there's something else that we can find in suffering. Not just joy, but we can actually find blessing. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. But he goes on to say there, there's a kind of suffering that does not bring a blessing. And that's suffering for sin. When you suffer in your life because you made stupid decisions and you sinned, that's not a blessing. Saying, don't, don't suffer for being a fool. Don't suffer for being a murderer or a thief or an evildoer. Don't suffer for being a meddler, which is a really interesting word to list in that list, right? You have some really heinous things like murder and thievery and evil doing, and then he has meddling, which is like, wait, Meddling? What's that? Like, basically, don't be annoying. Right? Like, know how to interact in society. I think, I think Peter's basically saying, hey, let's not just attract hostility. Like, let's do everything we can to not attract hostility in society. Don't just be a really annoying, awkward, pe like, pesky follower of Jesus in culture. Like, you're just going to invite suffering. Don't suffer for being a fool. That's pointless. There's no joy in that. There's no blessing in that if you suffer for sin. If you're just a, to a total jerk and you get ridiculed, that's not persecution. That's sin. And the natural consequences of sin. If you breathe murderous threats and you riot and you suffer because of that, that's not Christian persecution. That's suffering for sinning. The natural consequences of when you sin in this world of what happens. Not all suffering as a Christian is because you are a Christian. Sometimes you're just being an idiot. Right? Sometimes we just suffer in life because we're stupid. And we sin. We can't just wave the banner of, it's because I'm a Christian, this is persecution. No, Peter says sometimes it's sin. So let's, let's not do that kind of suffering. Let's avoid that suffering. And instead, let's suffer for being a follower of Jesus. Let's let the accusations against us be only that we represent Christ and we follow Him. And when that happens, that kind of suffering will be a blessing. Why? Why will that be a blessing? He tells us, the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Now, when you suffer for the name of Jesus, when you suffer for spreading the good news of the gospel, 
When you proclaim good news of what Jesus has done, there will be suffering that comes with that. But not only that, even as you live as a Christian, following countercultural moral ethics, you will also experience suffering. Right? Scripture lays out for us some very countercultural ways of living. Humility instead of pride and rage. That, that might bring some kind of suffering if you actually live humbly as a follower of Jesus. If you live generously, you might be taken advantage of. But you live generously because we follow a God who's generous. If you actually love your enemies, that might be dangerous for you. That might bring ridicule. If you actually live your life according to the, to the sexual ethics that God lays out in the New Testament, that all sexuality is reserved between a husband and a wife, if you stick to that, that might bring some kind of persecution. So it's not just only talking about the gospel, but even living your life in line with Scripture will bring persecution. And Peter says that's a blessing when that happens. In fact, it's aligned with the words of Jesus. He says in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they also persecuted the prophets who were before you. So Jesus says, or Peter says, you're blessed when this happens because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. I think what he's saying is your suffering is a foretaste of what's to come, of, of uh, not a foretaste, it's, uh, how do I say this? Your, your suffering is much like Christ's suffering was. There was suffering and then glory. Right? This, this idea of the spirit of glory resting upon you is this idea of, of end times glory. Or, or big fancy word, eschatological glory. That, that what's resting on you now is a taste of the glory that's coming. Your suffering doesn't just end in suffering, it ends in glory, much like Christ's suffering ends in glory, and you're now His people, it will be the same for you. And He's saying it's also a blessing because in the midst, God's very presence rests upon you, marking you as His people. This happened to all His prophets throughout the Old Testament. They represented Him, they called people to repentance, and they got rejected and killed. And it happened to Jesus... And it will happen to you. And it will be a marker that you belong to God. So rejoice. It's a blessing. He says, when it happens, don't be ashamed, but glorify God in that name. Often it's our shame that keeps us from suffering for Christ, is it not? It shouldn't be lost on us who's writing these words. Peter, what Jesus' greatest moment of greatest human need for support and friendship. Peter, one of his closest friends, vehemently denies knowing him three times because he's ashamed to be associated with Christ. He's now writing these words. Saying, I know what it's like to be ashamed and avoid suffering because of shame. And so let's hear his words through his story. That if you're ashamed for suffering for Christ, it's because you love comfort more than Christ. But let's also be encouraged by his story and the fact that Jesus did not cast him off, but restored him and forgave him. Because he paid for that on the cross. All of the rejection and the shame that Peter said was more important than Christ, Jesus went to the cross and paid for those very sins and does the same for us. If you have been ashamed or you've been walking in shame for representing Christ, Jesus paid for that on the cross. There is hope for you in repentance. You do not need to continue to walk in shame. Shame, in fact, will only flourish if you refuse to believe the gospel. When you believe the gospel, shame is gone. It has no place. And so, he's telling us there's joy to be found in suffering. There's blessing to be found in suffering. And then there's something strange. There's judgment to be found in suffering. Look at what he says in verse 17. It is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. Now, that might hit our ears and instantly kind of, wait, that sounds strange. I thought if we're covered by the blood of Jesus, 
We are forgiven. The New Testament says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How is it that there is judgment coming for us? Well, the, the New Testament is also clear that everyone will stand before Christ and give an account. Whether you are a Christian and whether you are not a Christian, everyone will be judged. Everyone will give an account. But it is those that have put their faith in Christ where we know what the outcome of that judgment will be. Yes, we will found to be sinners, but sinners who have been made righteous through faith. So we don't need to be fearful of standing before God in judgment because we know the outcome. Okay? We've been covered in the righteousness of Christ. But everyone will stand before God and give an account. So Peter's not saying that Christians, through this suffering, are being punished by God. This word judgment actually can mean punishment, but it can also just mean the action of a judge. And I think what Peter's saying here is he's saying that ju the eternal judgment that, God, that Jesus will do at the end is actually beginning now. That the suffering that Christians are experiencing right now at the hands of an unbelieving world is actually the judgment of God. Not meaning His punishment, but meaning His clarifying of who is actually His. Right? Remember at the beginning of this it says, don't be surprised at the fiery trial. Peter's used this language before, talking about this refining fire that suffering is. I think what he's saying is that judgment is beginning now in the sense that God is refining His people through suffering. Right? What does refining do? We don't tend to do this on a daily basis. But you put a precious metal in fire and it reveals the impurities and melts them away. So what you have coming out of the fire is something more pure and a stronger, more beautiful metal. That's what God is doing to His people through suffering. He is refining them, purifying them, and actually revealing who is actually His. Because those that are not true followers of Jesus, when they experience suffering, they're not going to endure. They're not going to rejoice. It's going to be revealed. Actually, they never believed. And so that's what I think Peter's saying when he's saying judgment begins with the household of God. He's marking out his children now. He's proclaiming and showing who is actually his and refining them and purifying them. But it's not something we need to fear. Because those that are his, he will hold on to. You have promise after promise throughout the scriptures that nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. You don't need to fear suffering, wondering, will I come out of this to the other side, a follower of Jesus? If you've trusted in Him, if you've repented and believed in Him, you are His. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. He will hold on to you. Let me read a quick quote here from Gentle and Lowly. I'm reading this partially because it's great and partially as a reminder, since you were all gifted this on Christmas Eve. <laughs> Pick it up and read it. It's really good. Um, what he talks about in this book, talking about the heart of Christ, and talks about Christ's hold on us. Here's what the author says. He says, When my two-year-old begins to wade into the gentle slope of the zero-entry swimming pool near our home, he instinctively grabs hold of my hand. He holds on tight as the water gradually gets deeper. But a two-year-old's grip is not very strong. Before long, it is not he holding on to me, but me holding on to him. Left to his own strength, he will certainly slip out of my hand. But I have determined that he will not fall out of my grasp. He is secure. He can't get away from me if he tried. So with Christ. We cling to him to be sure. But our grip is that of a two-year-old in in, amid the stormy waves of life. His sure grasp never falters. Psalm 63.8 expresses the double-sided truth. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. That's exactly what happens in the midst of suffering for the name of Christ. Yes, we cling to Him and must cling to Him, but our grip is weak. 
Our trust is that He has His hold on us. He will hold us fast. He will not let us go because we are His. So we do not need to be afraid of suffering. It cannot touch us. And so Peter's saying, if the righteous are saved with difficulty, he's not saying righteous are um, barely saved. He's saying the righteous are saved, and it's not easy. It's through great difficulty, even through suffering that the righteous are saved. How much worse will it be for those that disobey the gospel? This is one of those moments where Scripture is saying, yeah, if you don't believe in Jesus, it's going to be really bad for you. That's honesty. He's not running away from the wrath of God for sin. And he closes this section by saying, Let us suffer according to God's will and entrust our souls to a faithful creator while doing good. This, that could be the theme verse of 1 Peter. Let us suffer according to God's will and entrust our souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Because the place of suffering and persecution is redeemed ground. It's the ground where Jesus stood in our place. Where He suffered all the shame and the abuse and the ridicule and the scorn and the wrath and the punishment for our sin. So that now when we walk through persecution and suffering for His name's sake, it can't overtake us. In fact, it will actually refine us. Because suffering according to God's will, what Peter is saying, it's no longer to be feared because it's actually holy ground. Jesus has gone there before us. He's walked that very ground. It, that ground has now become the doorway into the kingdom of God. Suffering according to God's will. Because it was Jesus suffering according to God's will that made it possible for us to enter the family of God. So that now when we walk the steps on that very ground, we don't need to be afraid, but with every step we're sanctified. We're made more like Him as we suffer for His name. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher and theologian, said this, he said, Christian, Jesus does not suffer so as to exclude your suffering. He bears a cross, not that you may escape it, but that you may endure it. Christ exempts you from sin, but not from sorrow. Remember that and expect to suffer. Church, let's not be scared of something so momentary. Something so under God's control. If you suffer, it is according to His will. And He's given us all that we need to endure. So we don't need to be afraid or fearful of persecution. We don't need to, to lie awake at night being fearful that maybe re the religious freedom within this country might go away. Sure, that's great, and we all enjoy it. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. But friends, we don't need it. We don't need religious freedom. We don't need laws or, or a country that pro protects religious declarations. We don't need that. The church has thrived for centuries throughout the world without it. We need Christ. He will hold us fast. He will preserve the gospel. He will preserve the church. So if those things go away someday, or if we find ourselves somewhere in the world where you don't have those kinds of protection, you are no less safe. Christ will hold us fast. And so we read these words from Peter. Now he talks about suffering and we realize maybe it's not so scary after all. I mean, it's not the worst thing in the world to happen to the church. Maybe actually through it, sometimes God allows the gospel to thrive in ways that it wouldn't. And maybe if we could have this kind of perspective of suffering that the disciples did, maybe our prayers would start to change. And they wouldn't be things like, protect us from suffering, 
Maybe there would be prayers like this that Paul says from prison in Ephesians chapter 6. He says, pray also for me. What? That you would be set free from prison and stop having to suffer? No. That, my, that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am, ambassador, am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Maybe if we come to understand that we should expect suffering as followers of Jesus, maybe our prayers look more like this. Not, Lord, protect me from it, but Lord, give me boldness in the face of it. Because we are an ambassador for the gospel. Witness over comfort. Amen? Amen. To God be the glory. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, it is impossible for us to believe these things apart from your grace. We need you to awaken our hearts again and again to believe these things, that you are better than comfort, that you are better than safety, that you are better than prosperity, that emptying our hands and clinging only to Christ is better than anything else. And so, Lord, we want to be a people that say it is better to be safe in you than to be safe from suffering. Lord, would you fill our eyes with a vision of who you are. Lord, forgive us for the ways that we are ashamed of being associated with you. Forgive us for the ways that we run away from suffering thinking that we deserve comfort. Lord, we need you to make us a church. Make us a church that walks side by side, not afraid of any kind of suffering for your name. Lord, would you make us bold? Lord, we pray that you would sweep your gospel across the city, that you would bring people to repentance and faith in droves. But Lord, even if that is not your will, help us be faithful in the midst of suffering. Help us endure. Hold us fast. And we know you'll get the glory either way. We love you, Jesus. Thank you that you are with us. We pray this in your name. Amen.